The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. Let's talk about the story of the literal fear of becoming the crazy cat lady. It's Stephen King's Sleepwalkers. What the fuck? Um. Hey, once again, everybody, this is Michael T. Bradley. And Audrey Ivancy. We are here on my two-year anniversary of moving to the fine city of Portland, Oregon, to talk about Stephen King's Sleepwalkers. Let's, uh, let's see. Basic plot in the movie, pretty goddamn simple since there are about four scenes in this film. Mother and son move into town. They are, in fact, creepy sleepwalker creatures. The origin of the vampire, perhaps. They try to suck the life out of a girl, fail... Virgin. ...and hijinks ensue. There you go. All right, let's go to our what-the-fuck moments, which, which are not many. Audrey? One bullet from a gun can make a cop car explode. And the Raging Bull slap cam. I really enjoyed that. There are so many things I, that we could talk about with this movie, but they aren't... I, a lot of them aren't necessarily, like, large points. Like, we have... The fact that every teen in the movie is played by, like, a 30-something, which is a little off-putting. I mean, this is, I believe, post-Twin Peaks, or right in the middle of it, where Madhya Namik, no idea if I'm pronouncing that correctly, where she was playing, like, a 22-year-old, like, somebody fresh out of high school, but obviously not in high school, you know? So that was kind of, I, it felt... Uh, that felt a little weird, didn't you think? I think that was kind of popular for the time. Wait, it wasn't really that popular? Yeah, I mean, since, like, Mean Girls, I think, kind of changed everything. Did it? Was that well, what clueless? changed it? Clueless. Or maybe it was Gummo. Maybe Gummo. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. There must have been a stuffed cat clearance. I think, I think that's how this movie was made. Stephen King got a really good deal on, like, a giant box of stuffed cats and was like, how can I put this to use? Is that, do you think that's maybe the origin of this movie? Sure. Because the, the sleepwalkers, <laughs> uh, the main characters, the, the son and the mother, are uh, somewhat allergic to cat scratches. It's never really clear how much it hurts them. It, it seems like the way you can defeat them is through using cat presents. Right, throwing stuffed cats at them. That seems <laughs> to do the job eventually. Yeah. Eventually they just set on fire. Again, there are literally, like, only four scenes in this movie, and, and one of the scenes is Mancha Namik, who thinks the new guy is hot, takes him to the graveyard to... I Sorry, I just remembered one of the best what-the-fuck moments. The mother and son fucking? Yeah. <laughs> sorry. There's that, and then, you get to, and then you get to see them in the mirror. That's right. And it kind of looks like they're in fat suits. I didn't get that. So, so they're allergic to cats, but... When they're in their true form, they kind of look like hairless baby cats. That are really big. Or possibly ferret creatures. That are like six feet tall. Well, yes. <laughs> With no hair. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but they, I mean, they look like kind of baby They ferrets, look like baby. baby mice when they first come out of mice mom. And yeah, maybe that's what they are. They're yeah. mice, you they think? Look like, they look like baby mice that got supersized. There you go. Supersized baby mice, and the cats are on the job. <laughs> so... Machin asks him to go to a graveyard with her, and this is we've learned from a previous uh, scene in the movie that the graveyard is the place the place where everybody fucks basically. All the high school kids go to fuck, right? Yeah, the what is or it? Give homestead, homeland, homeland, or give blowjobs. There was an an inordinate amount of like tongue and cheek behavior. Yes, <laughs> there you go of tongue and cheek comments. And here's the thing: I'm 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 curious. Did you like? Growing up for you, was the graveyard like the place to go to make out? Because I've seen that in movies a lot. And I've read that in books, and I only ever know one person who actually liked to do that in her real life, take guys to graveyards to fuck. But she was a goth, and mm -hmm. so I'm like... Yeah, no, I think people like to hang out there and try to do artistic projects when I was a kid. I think people like to make out anywhere you could smoke. So, so I guess, yes. So there. off campus... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I guess it would qualify. It fits all the criteria. Yeah. But no, I don't I, I find it I find it strange and I find it a little it works really well in a horror movie because there are all sorts of like, you know, sex equals life in the midst of death sort of Well, I just think they didn't have any state parks or any like fun playgrounds. I think that's what they have. <laughs> There you go. Yeah. This is cow country. They had no... But I grew up in cow country, and people just made out in barns or 
their <laughs> room or whatever. They didn't have a barn available to them, apparently. Also, I like that she invites him out there to take photos, and then somehow it turns into he does charcoal rubbings, but that really, like, that never, it really kind of, like, just happened that way. It didn't come up. But that leads me to the, the, the crux of this whole movie is this scene, okay? Because the first half of the movie, before the pivot point, is essentially him getting to know this girl, and you find out that he's getting this girl so that he can eat her soul or whatever, and... Transmit it to his mother. Yeah, or eat some of her soul, get her weak enough, and he can take her to his mother. Essentially, he's, he's, he's going to feed this girl to his mother in some form or fashion, right? And he starts by stalking her and opening up a yearbook, circling her photo, going to her work where she's playing Cinderella at the movie theater, and she gives him some free popcorn, and they set up, essentially, a future date yeah, the, the following day. <laughs> speaking of him, when he marks the... The yearbook, he's just sitting around shirtless, looking at comics and cutting himself. <laughs> like, I mean, that's, you know, typical teen activity. That Carving we all do. her first initial into her arm. <laughs> In, into his arm, yeah, yeah. yeah. And from the fact that he carves the initial into his arm, and the fact that he later says to his mom, does it have to be her, you are uh, led down this false trail of thinking that... He doesn't perhaps, like to go out with old bitches. Right, that perhaps he's tired of fucking his mom, or else he just, he finds something appealing in Manchin Amik that he hasn't in before. Because we, we saw from the opening scene in Bodega Bay, <laughs> where in a hotel there was a desiccated corpse of a young girl, a little girl who was probably 30. We, we see that, you know, he's, he's done this before, and that's what we infer from that. And that's my question is, how the hell did he, well, okay, so, so let me back up for a second here. We're led down this false trail that he's actually not going to go through with it, that, that perhaps, you know, he's going to side with the girl and this is going to become them versus his mother, da 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 And instead, he just turns and he tries to take her out. My question is, how did he ever do this before? Because he's so bad at it. He, he is really bad. I think his mom's very manipulative, though. Remember, she was very jealous of this this new girl that he wants to go see, and she takes up a dance. They go and do it. She's like, do you like her more than me kind of stuff? And he has to convince her otherwise. I don't know if she's manipulative or not. I don't know how much of that whole opening was real or red herring and they were actually just playing with each other. Because we do see eventually that he, I mean, he just has no compunction about beating the shit out of Machin Amik and uh, trying to force her to die. Like, he doesn't, you know, there's no, like, moment where he's torn or anything. It's just completely him setting a trap and trying to take her down. So I, I, I really think that we're supposed to, in that first half, think that she's getting jealous and, you know, there's this tension between them. But no, it's not really there. I, I, but I don't she's know. She's just hungry. Yeah, she's, she's just she, really hungry. She's just hangry. Hangry. Which I hate that term. You but love it. No, I... Um, <laughs> So yeah, he's really bad at it. Yeah. So instead of like, you know, trying to seduce her, take her back to his place, maybe give her some drugs, make her a little sleepy, he just decides to start saying really brass things to her. Like, isn't this what you wanted, baby? It doesn't have to hurt. Yeah, totally. Right. He could have taken her, her back to his place. His mom could have been invisible because they have that power to mm -hmm. turn invisible. And then... You know, once he gets her drugged and maybe has some fun with her, maybe the mom's into watching that. Who knows? It's a kind of deviant film. So, yeah. sure, let's let's go that route. Let's, let's you know, I, I could play out my Majin Amik fantasies all day. But uh, trying to stay on target here, they could have set up a much better trap. Yeah. As, especially considering, let's say that it works, right? Let's say that he kills her or, you know, gets her into a super weakened state, takes her back to his mom, feeds her then... Then he has a desiccated corpse, and her parents knew that he was out with her. Uh -huh. So, I mean, what's the story then? Like, oh, this this mugger came by and turned her into a desiccated corpse? I'm sorry, Mrs. Robertson, or whatever? I, that's, I, I mean, just nothing about this plan is good. The entire reason that that scene exists is to be like, oh shit, I fooled you. This movie isn't going the way that you expect it to go, but... I just didn't care enough to be like, oh my god, what a twist. And the second reason is, I think in the director's cut, it actually flashes on the screen the text, this is a rape metaphor, just in case you aren't getting it. Yeah, that's in the, it ends up being what it is, right? Yeah. Where it, she goes back to her house, she's in the bathtub. She just has to get clean. She has to get clean. It's so like, I, I mean, I, I don't want to... 
I don't want to downplay rape and how horrible that is, but the metaphor is so horrible that it comes across as cheesy and ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think maybe that scene is good to introduce Clovis, I guess, into the equation again, to bring the significance of why they're afraid of cats. Because the movie starts with all these cats that are hanging from this kind of country house near, what, in Bodega Bay? Bodega Bay. What, there's probably a hundred cats hanging, and the police come <laughs> and discover this virginal body of some dried up little girl, girl. little girl with a rose uh, in her hair. Right, and, and that's where we get the first of our many cameos. Mm -hmm. There we have Mark Hamill. We also have Joe Dante, uh, John Landis, uh, Toby Hooper, Clive Barker, Stephen King. Clive Barker? Yeah. What? The one with the British accent. <laughs> oh, I didn't even see it. Who yeah. Was... He's the, he's, he's the guy who looks like Clyde Barker and says, uh, you'll have to go talk to the sheriff. <gasps> <laughs> Audrey's mind blown. Oh and, remember right, and remember right after he talked, I said, wow, Clyde Barker looks so young. No, I didn't. I wasn't paying any attention. I think I was over in space. And then, then we had like a 10-minute conversation about Hellraiser. Anyway, it's, it's all right. So yeah, it was, it was cameo a go-go in this film. Just in general, this movie, just I, I, I don't think they should have let Stephen King write a screenplay without a few other people to back him up, because he obviously just didn't know what the hell he was doing, uh, and, and, and that was a little painful. I think the movie would have been great if the special effects weren't so ugly. I honestly didn't, I, the special effects, I didn't mind most Well, you of can't them. have like a romance, you can't, it's hard for me to romanticize characters if they look really ugly, you know? Like, you don't say, oh, that beautiful vampire is so disgusting looking. I want to be a vampire when I grow up. Right, but, the, I mean, it, it, was, it was playing against that, right? It was trying to, I mean, you know, they obviously picked this lead kid because he is, I, I should say uh, kid, he still looks older than me. All-American, blonde. Right, he, he's the, the star quarterback look that it would make sense for Maude Chenamit to be like, ooh, I want to get my panties wet for him, blah, 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 blah. Sorry, I just, I can play out the Majin Amid fan. Me and Ron Perlman. Her popcorn pops. There you go. <laughs> she, <laughs> she, uh, she wanted to give him more than a free popcorn, let me tell you. Ron Perlman at one point says she needs a spanking and if her daddy won't do it, I will. And gladly I, volunteers. I kept waiting for that to be Act 3. That's, that's another, I guess he's a cameo. I, I don't know, at that point, I don't think Ron Perlman was as big as he, as well known as he is now. So I don't know if he was a cameo or just a guy. Glenn Shaddock's also in it uh, from Beetlejuice. Again, that would have been almost, I think like Beetlejuice was maybe a year before this. So oh, think, no, it was way before. Was it? Was oh, it? yeah, this is like 90s. Yeah, it's not, but it's like 90, 91, isn't it? I, I think it's really We should it. really do research before. I think that should be a part of the show. <laughs> <laughs> There's another, speaking of Clovis, there's another cop chase in here, and Clovis is the wacky cop's sidekick, like, and, and this cat is there way more than any cat has ever been in a real police situation, uh -huh. but it was awesome, because Clovis is essentially the star of the movie. I mean, he's, he's really the protagonist. I want a cat slash Machinamique only cut of this film. I think I would way more enjoy that. Sadly, though, Machin Amik is kind of an idiot in this film. Like, like every turn, she's just doing the dumbest thing possible, except... Well, she's like 16 years old. <laughs> right. I mean, she's just, she doesn't even have her driver's license yet. She hasn't even had she sex yet. She can't vote. She can't have sex yet. Her parents are very strict. She has to be <laughs> home by 5 p.m. on a Saturday afternoon. <laughs> right. She lives a very sheltered life. There you go. I, do horror movies just in general love cop chases? Cop car chases. I think they please, like donate the the cars. Because we had that in Leprechaun, and now this, and uh, it seemed it just seemed odd to me. I was like, I don't think I've seen as many action movies with cop car chases as the horror movies that we've watched as we've been doing this so far. Mm -hmm. I really kind of wanted a Clovis and Tanya spinoff. <laughs> I think they should become like Sleepwalker hunters after this. Oh, that's cool. Nice. Ride around in the cop car and learn karate. <laughs> sure. And one of them wears sunglasses, but I don't know which one yet. For the sleepwalkers, which I guess, I guess that's what we're calling them. For the sleepwalkers, because that bullshit thing at the beginning from the, like, Chillicothe Book of Demons says mm -hmm. there's sleepwalkers. Yep. Can you imagine their life must just be one long cat scare, right? Yeah. Because... <laughs> which... They never even thought about getting a fucking dog. No, not once. Maybe they're allergic to dogs, too. Who knows? You'd think they'd take care of the problem, though, right? 
Well, but every dog I've ever seen is completely cowed by cats, so... Well, what about what that Michael Phelps? Not Phelps, not the swimmer. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Vick. Michael Vick's dogs. Like a white dog, except like an anti-cat dog. Yeah, or, or a shotgun. Or shotgun. Yeah, right. it's like, you know, they're using, like, bear traps out there to try to trap these cats, and they could have just got a gun. And assuming... Or a pet control, a- animal control. Yeah, they, we, they, they call the sheriff once, but then never again. And it, it... I mean, just in general, they seem so... Passive. Fucking worthless at this. It's like, well, at Bodega Bay, they apparently killed a girl and hung, like, 80 cat corpses around the house. And here, they can't do shit. It's like it's the first time, but we know that they have experience. From yeah, they just, they just seem really horrible at their jobs. And, like, for instance, his teacher figures out that he's a fake from the fact that on their transcripts, they used a town that doesn't exist. Paradise Falls. Ohio. Ohio. But they're, like, in Indiana, and it's like, well, I mean, I know this is pre-internet, but Is that Jesus... the part when, when uh, Mr. Phallus yeah. goes for his dick in the car? There's other ways to pay people other than that's, money. That's right, that's right. He <laughs> he is apparently a child molester, although since that kid was obviously, like, 28 at least, I don't think that's he that He was crazy. a consenting adult. <laughs> Well, he was non-consenting, but he could have just said no rather than ripping his fucking hand He wanted off. his hand. But in any case, it just it, it, it's like there were atlases in those days. There were <laughs> easy ways to look things up, right? Atlases. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There were... Well, I don't... How I else? I mean, there was, like, telephones and stuff and, like... People at a school you could ask with an education. <laughs> there There's you a go. library mm-hmm. and an atlas. <laughs> <laughs> I had many atlases in my I'm life. sure you did, Michael. You know, earlier I was speaking of how dumb Machin is in this movie. I had a couple of good moments. She says the line, It's wonderful to feel. And there is such a long pause <laughs> that it really felt like that was just the end of the thought. <laughs> it's wonderful to feel. Well, good. Okay. Also, she says about his story that he reads in class, which literally says when something... His life. Right, and, and, and which seems also really dumb, right? Just to tell people, they were sleepwalkers. They fed off the lines. Yeah. But it ends with like him being like, they always had to run, scared of the man, and, you know, forever, never having a home. And she afterwards says, like, like she's asked, what do you think about it? What was your interpretation? She's like, it's sad because they don't have a home. And he's like, you get me. You understand me. And it's like, that's what the fucking story said. It's not... <laughs> You know, it's like... like, I already told you that. I already told you about (laughs) me. How did you remember? It's like doing literary criticism on Independence Day and being like, this is a story about aliens. The end. That happened on July 4th. (laughs) There you go. Also, the dumb, dumb, dumbest point in the movie is she's just smacked him in the head with a camera knocked him down, and he's obviously been trying to force himself on her in some way, shape, or fashion. And he's over there not moving, and she starts to run away, and then she's like, oh boy, did I hurt him? And Aww. and slowly walks back to him. Why? Why, 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 why would you do so that? So I think we could get that next part, which is her grabbing the corkscrew and trying to pull his eye out of his head. D-eyeing him D-eyeing. With, with, the, uh, with the wine corkscrew. Which, I really wanted that scene to go on for like nine more minutes and just have him keep throwing her down. And I she wanted finds... wine to come out of the eye. Instead, we got blood. <laughs> she keeps finding different picnic utensils that she can use to take him down one more bit at a time. Like, um, I don't know, she gets an apple and pulls the stem out of it and, and puts it in his ear. And... Chopstick in the nose. Yeah, just bit by bit by bit. Uh, she pulls like a wicker piece off of the picnic basket and strangles him with it. <laughs> Just piece it, it, but it it really doesn't. The effects. You had a problem with the effects that they were ugly. I my only problem with the effects is probably the thing that I enjoyed most about the film, which is that any time a cat attacks, it looks like Tunces is on the prowl, and <laughs> because obviously they can't throw a real cat on someone and have them flail around. So instead, it's just somebody staples a fake cat to their costume, and That's they put their still, costume on. It doesn't on. have any weight on it. Right. <laughs> and all the cats are obviously fake. 
I remember I actually saw this movie in the theater because when I was younger, I was huge Stephen King fan. Huge, like 500 pounds. And it was like my favorite thing ever. And so I went and saw this probably the weekend it came out and I was so shocked by how bad it was. I felt so betrayed. And there's one thing that they changed on the video release. They, they might have changed more. There's one thing that I know that they changed on the video release that made me very sad because I tried showing this to a friend a few years later and it was like, you won't believe how fucking horrible this is and then it's not there. In the scene where all the cops are talking to each other about like, oh, I, I saw his face and it changed, that scene now starts out with a master shot of the town or something. In the theater, it was all of them talking, and you could see the boom mic very clearly going from one character to another. I don't know how that made it past however many people it has to make it past before Let me tell this. you, let me tell you, there were um, four sound directors and two music directors. <laughs> Those sound directors, here was their job. Louder. Make it louder. Because the entire movie plays at a kind of normal volume, but then any time a trap springs or a car starts, it sounds as or if it's... Or a cat dies or gets caught in a trap. It sounds like it's happening inside your head. <coughs> it is so loud. It's, it's as if they got paid by the decibel. Did you notice everything in this movie is, is so... It's as if... They knew what subtext was and then just threw that out the window. Did you notice the food that she's preparing? The when chicken? He's, yeah. She, yeah. Well, and and the she... The apricot pie? Well, I, I believe it was peaches. I thought they were pretty small for peaches. Okay, well, they maybe they were ap apricots then. But they, they there's like a spatchcock chicken and her slicing up either a peach or an apricot, which, you know, both very Yannick images, right? As her son is coming back from this rape scene. Mm -hmm. And it was like, really, guys? Like, really? Like, I, I, this is, it just felt crude to me. Well, I think that it was trying to. We're about to see his face be all raw and, and cut up. And we're looking at raw chicken and she's cutting up apricot. No, but to me, it was all about rape. It was her performing her own little rape while he was performing a larger rape. I think that that's how they were giving more value to the situation. Because if you were just to kind of say, oh, she goes out to have a picnic with this guy and he makes advances and she says no and he tries to grab her and then she corks him in the eye with a corkscrew and runs away. Because it seems that he was just trying to make out with her. He wanted her to live so that he could take her soul out of her mouth. <laughs> he didn't try to undo his pants. He didn't try to rip off her pants or her shirt. Right, but it was obviously a rape metaphor. It right? could have been. I, I, I think I think it was I think that was yeah doesn't have to hurt I mean come on I mean that was you know that was the line I I'm used gonna on rip your soul out of your mouth that was the line I used on you the... <laughs> <laughs> it worked it worked yes <laughs> and speaking of unsubtle and weird a lot of crazy fun deaths in this movie we have death by slight head tap <laughs> the mother is able to tap two guys head together twice. Obviously very gently, she doesn't have a lot of force behind her taps at that point, and they immediately die. Uh, death, death by Clovis. That's right, that's right. Clovis, Clovis plus 50 other cats, right? Yes, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> like Clovis <laughs> leads the charge. I love how Clovis gets there, climbs up a tree, knocks open a window, and fuck it, Clovis is seriously the star Badass, of this movie. Yeah. We had Death by Corn Cob. Oh yeah, that's a good one. And then the, the father goes to answer the door, and it's the mother, and she scratches him in the face, and he just falls down and looks like he dies. Now, now, to be fair, she scratches him in the face by shoving a glass container of roses into oh, his face. Oh, that's right. Oh, that's right. So he Very gets... Grifters. yeah. So he gets cut a little bit by glass and a little bit by a thorn. That's easily murder right there. Then there is death by compound fracture to the face. Ooh, yeah. That's how Ron Perlman gets taken out. She snaps his elbow so he bites, that his, she bites off his fingers and then she snaps his arm so that a bone pops out and then shoves that into his face it's pretty tight yeah that I, whoever the fight choreographer was or I I, whoever conceptualized that was yeah and maybe that was king that cool. that that was the, the deaths in the movie were were fun i mean they were always fun i think i think we should talk more about incest do we need to stop the podcast or <laughs> No, go for it. What what do you, what do you have to say about that? I just that? think um, this is when I watched this movie when I was a kid. It used to be on HBO all the time. I probably saw it a hundred times. This is that was the most significant thing about the movie, and I thought it was interesting when we began talking about this during the podcast. 
it was like one of the last things we mentioned. But it was the first thing I remembered, always going back to this movie. It's a movie about cats where there's these two lovers that also happen to be mother and son. They have intense love scenes. They are in it together, but they are mated for each other. Yeah. But they, they come of the same flesh. I think it's pretty interesting. You, and, think, you think it's hot. Well, I think it's supposed <laughs> to be hot. <laughs> I, I, it's, I, I like, you know, guys with dark hair. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I... I think there were a lot of things about this movie that were there to shock you. I think it was like, this is a horror movie like no horror movie you've seen before. Because in this one, we are going to uh, the obviously, like, love cures everything and he gets taken out of this lifestyle. That's not going to happen. He's going to try to fucking suck her soul out no matter what. And uh, cats who are always there to scare you are now there to protect you. This is such a switcheroo, and this is shocking. And so I think the incest was meant to be that as well. Mm -hmm. And it just, I, I don't know, maybe I'm just jaded, but I was just kind of like, oh, yeah. Oh, this is totally normal. Right. Yeah, it just totally. didn't. I, I just see that. You know, hot mom, hot kid. Yeah. <laughs> it just didn't, because I didn't give a shit about the characters at all, and they were so flat, I was just like, okay, whatever. I think it's because when they morphed, when they shapeshifted, those special effects weren't cool. But I mean, for the incest, you don't need the special effects to be cool, right? I'm just saying, once I see it, it's kind of like from Dust Till Dawn, where they turn into those ugly vampires, or in, I'm gonna say it, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, when the faces morph mm -hmm. into the creatures. I just don't like the way it looks. Because I'm used to seeing, like, Bram Stoker's Dracula, where everyone's really good looking. <laughs> and, you know, uh, Interview with the Vampire, where everyone's mm -hmm. very good looking and, and get to sustain their looks and still be evil. But I guess, you know, if these are shapeshifters that are sleepwalkers or their own thing, but um, instead of... They're, they're ferret. Baby they're ferrets. Ba they're baby ferrets. <laughs> or baby mice. Skinless. Skin, I mean, no, skin. Skin? Hairless. Hairless. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> They're all with the skin. Skin is loose. A, and it, like it, a sphinx cap. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. In the mirror, it I, I thought it looked like they were wearing fat suits because they're just kind of blubbery, yeah. when, especially when they're on top of each other. And wrinkly, like a sphinx. Or like a newborn cat. Yeah. The Or a newborn anything, really. Yeah, for me, the, the only point where it was kind of like even slightly shocking is right before we pan to the mirror when you see her or him basically mauling her on the bed uh, and even that to me i i don't know for me it just it was such a non-starter issue but yeah inya we hear that uh what is it how do you say this word Bordesia? Bodicia? No. Oh, Bode, 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 Bodacia? Bodacia? I don't think that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that really popular song. And then they play Sleepwalkers by Santo and Johnny, which is one of my favorite songs from La Bamba. All right, learn okay. something new every day. Cool. Did, did you notice that when <laughs> when Charles, when she re... I, I, I guess he's actually alive. I don't... I, it's really up in the air whether he's oh, alive in that scene. last scene. Yeah. Did you notice that when he dances with her, but he's apparently being puppeted by yes. the mom, he looks a lot like Joe Cocker? I really wanted... <laughs> I didn't Whoa, catch that. Whoa, what did you do? It was say yes. I really wanted that to That's kick in. That's wonderful, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> because I thought it might, because earlier we got a random music video with Mach and Amik. She's just sweeping the floor with this vacuum from, like, 1937 uh -huh. that's horrible. I mean, it's just one of those little push broom vacs that doesn't actually do anything. Like, you can literally see that there's still crap on the floor. Yeah, the metal one that drops shit when you use it. Yeah. <laughs> and and she just suddenly goes into a, do you love me, uh, music video. There was also Extremes, It's a Monster. The music just kind of ranged everywhere mm -hmm. in, in, this, in this show. Before we do, what would you change to make this better? I want to talk about a very serious subject. The physics of how that goddamn front door works. Because at one, at one point earlier in yeah. the film, the cops are chasing down the boy because they realize that they, you know, they think that he's uh, tried to molest the girl and they're going after him. And they kick in the front door and you see it very obviously fall on the ground. The uh, the mom and the son uh, go invisible. They dim. Yeah, so uh, the cops don't see them there. So they go back out and they go on stakeout. They hear something, and it is the door being closed again. Later, 
the mom goes out, grits Machin on Meek, and brings her back to the house to dance with her son and feed her son and make him better because he's near death and possibly dead at that point. It's really unclear. She, he wants to rape her again. Right. <laughs> but, but this time it's... The mom. Soul sucking. <laughs> Balls. The... <laughs> She closes the front door as if it just opens and closes normally now. Mm -hmm. Then a sheriff busts in, or, or somebody, a police officer busts in, comes in and distracts the mom enough for Mancha and Amik to get away, and she goes to a side door for some god-unknown reason, because the front door is obviously open, like seven feet away from her. The sheriff comes with her, has trouble with the door as well, finally gets it open, and they go out, and it's the front door again. There's also that hole from them driving the police car into the house. Right. And if the door was open, that's when those cats started to roll in. So it, d it doesn't seem as if that door was not closed. I don't think the cats actually stream in until Clovis leads the charge, though. It, it yeah, takes but then they Clovis... get in through the door, right? Uh, or do they possibly. get into the hole? I think they get in through everywhere. Okay. The cats, I, and, and, and they don't really even come in that much at all, because when the cats actually attack her, it's outside. Mm. Most of the cats just lounge out there. They, I don't understand their motivations. Yeah. They, they're drawn to them, I guess. I think they're on the same, like, vibrational right. field. Yeah. Yeah. They can see each other, even when they're dim. So what, right, that's true. We see cat ray vision at one point, and we can see the invisible sun in his changing car. So what What was that front door a metaphor for? Because obviously it was something. I don't know. Why don't you tell me, Michael? <laughs> I have no idea. I'm, I'm thinking perhaps it's a wormhole. It's an unsteady wormhole that happens to be attached to the house. Um, that allows in police officers and kitty cats? Yes. Okay, from a different dimension? One of 12? Are we talking about string ball theory? <laughs> kitty kitty! String ball, nice. I, it, there's something going on with that door. I think that's the hinge around the entire, around which the entire movie pivots. If think, we could figure... I think you just made that up. <laughs> if we could figure out that door, we would know everything. Just take a little nap and contact your penal gland. <laughs> penal? Pen, penil. 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 <laughs> I'll let you contact Thank my you. penile gland. I haven't any done day. any reading on that. I just use it. <laughs> <laughs> so, what one thing would you change about this movie to make it better? I would have more Stephen King, of course, acting in it because I really like him. And let's see what else. I would have had him drug her and then take her soul early on in the movie. And then also, which leads me to my original suggestion, which I hadn't brought up yet, is I would have put in line some additional virginal victims to take in case, you know, hedge your bets a little better because they were putting all their eggs in one basket with Tanya. They could have found like five other Tanyas and just set them up day to week. Tinder. Or they could have had a party. He could have been like, my mom's out. I want to meet everybody. Hey, everybody, come have a party. Here, and then come one, upstairs with me. Right, one by one, he leads them away for different reasons, and they're just... Yeah, pew, totally. Pew. Yeah. That would have been smart. Would have been a much shorter movie. <laughs> would have. But then, I don't know, Clovis. Somebody brings Clovis. And, then, and then things get wacky. Yeah, it should be a costume party, and Clovis is in a disguise. <laughs> 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 and then there's the great reveal, and then Clovis busts out of his costume. Right. <laughs> Who is that ghost that keeps interfering with us? <laughs> Just an idea. Yeah. I think I one thing to save the movies. <laughs> Don't make it. Just, it should have never been. What are you talking about? I like this movie. <laughs> oh my god, this is, it's such a horrible movie. I want, well, as I say, I think just a, if all the movie were like the first ten minutes, and then it turned into Clovis and Tanya Sleepwalker Hunters, mm -hmm. then I could maybe be okay. I think what saved this movie was the music, the soundtrack. It, it, Because it, it just kind of sticks with you, or it did for me the last 15, 20 years. I, I I mean, I think the song Sleepwalkers definitely does because they play it so many and that times. And song. I didn't even, I thought you were joking. I thought the music just sounded like Enya. No, it's not. The, the music that sticks with me the most from this movie is the fucking, when, like, during the attack scene, when it's the Looney Tunes, like, that, that I mean, bullshit. mean, the sounds. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't really call that music. But, but it's obviously the score, and it was just, 
It felt pretty horrible. The good news is that the director here, Mick Garris, and Stephen King went on to make The Stand, which was one of the best... Longest movies yeah. ever made. And, and one of the best adaptations of the King work out there, I think. Which, they're, supposedly, they're going to redo that. And I'm like, I don't... I, don't, I mean, whatever. I yeah. guess they just keep redoing anything, Dune. so... Dune? They keep redoing Dune. Though. Yeah, yeah, Dune it's keeps... Just longer. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Jackson's Dune. Three three-hour movies to really capture those knife fights. All right, well, for now, I think I think that's all I've got to say on this. Uh, so, So, please, if you have comments, if you agree, disagree, if you thought Charles <laughs> Brady was hot, write to us at info at iceonmars.net. Otherwise, this is Michael T. Bradley. And Audrey Ivins here. Have a good one. Bye. You have been listening to Ice on Mars. 